Hey everyone, welcome back to Mr. Measures Lessons. In today's video, I'm going to be going over chapter one of John Steinbeck's Of Mice and Men. Unfortunately, I am out of school due to Corona break, but I wanted to make these videos to help clarify some information from the chapters as well as give an overview for my students who are also on Corona break. I'm not sure when we'll be back, but I'll keep these videos up as long as I can and hopefully we can get some thorough analysis of each book that we are covering in class. Okay, so if you've got your discussion question packet that we printed out as well, lucky you, if you do not have the printed version, that's okay, access the online version, but today I will be answering a few of the discussion questions from the packet. It will also be available online. So, without further ado, let's dig into it. One of the main reasons that I picked Of Mice and Men and thought that it would be a good novel for us to cover is because it's much different than the other novels or short stories that we've read in class. We read a lot of the early modernism stories and early feminism stories, and a lot of those stories featured people from around the 1920s, early 20th century most of the time, and... Of Mice and Men travels into the 1930s. Now, the 1920s versus the 1930s are different for a plethora of reasons. But if you know history at all, you know that that is when the Great Depression happened. So our economic structure that had been built up because of World War I has now unfortunately crashed and... We are moving into the Great Depression, somewhat caused by the crash of the stock market, somewhat caused by the Dust Bowl. These were all contributing factors, but for the rich, life was pretty bad. For the middle class or the poor, life really sucked. And this novel covers, it follows two characters. Our main character is George, but very closely next to George is Lenny. And the story follows these two migrant workers. They are, they're Americans, but they are traveling the United States looking for work. They are having trouble finding a place to work because Lenny has some mental disabilities and those often get them into trouble. So think of maybe Tom and Jerry or Ed Ed and Eddie, <laughs> unfortunately because Lenny doesn't understand all of the social constructs that the United States has at the time, he ends up getting into some trouble with wherever they end up working. So they don't end up working there too long. But George has a plan. He will take them to a farm. They'll earn up a... They'll make a stake and make a lot of money, and then they're going to buy this farm with bunnies. Be careful notion of the... Uh, bunnies. Uh, Lenny is very excited about these bunnies. So, um, digging right into the first few pages of the novel, this is the version of the novel I'm going over. I think everybody has that one. But as we look at the first page, we see that we are getting a very poetic and descriptive essay and intro of the book. And this is a lyrical love of nature. The author John Steinbeck worked very hard to create this lush beautiful environment in our head uh, lines such as the water is warm too for it has dipped twinkling over the yellow sands and the sunlight before reaching the narrow pool on one side of the river between the golden foothill slopes curve up to the strong and rocky Gabillion mountains but on the valley side, the water is lined with trees, willows fresh and green with every spring, carrying in their lower leaf junctures the derbis of the winter's flooding, and sycamores with mottled white recumbent limbs and branches that arch over the pool. Wow. Very descriptive. If this had shown up in any of your descriptive essays, I would have been very impressed. This is a very... Nice job by John Steinbeck giving a beautiful account of what the nature looks like. And the 1920s focused on a lot of modern pieces of the United States, but 
a lot of 1930s reels it back because America has always been beautiful in the 1920s they had reason to detail the big cities like New York City and our sprawling infrastructure in the 1920s were around when our infrastructure really started to pick up but the 1930s as we know was the Great Depression so a lot of houses were dilapidated work was kind of scant uh, I believe they were called Hoover houses a lot of people didn't have a home. So even the lucky people weren't doing all that great. Uh, that is certainly the case for George and Lenny. The original title of the novel was Something That Happened. Now, I don't know about you, but I absolutely hate that title. Really, you couldn't give me anything more descriptive or specific that just kind of sucks. I'm very happy that we got the title of Mice and Men. We meet the, the mice in the first chapter. But the title is a symbolic representation of one side of characters versus the other. And as we dig deeper in, I will explore that more. But for now, as we dig into the first few pages, George is described as pretty good guy. Uh, Lenny is described as a kind of wonky guy. Um, the first man was small and quick, dark of face, with restless eyes and sharp, strong features. Every part of him was defined. Small, strong hands, slender arms, a thin and bony nose. Behind him walked, a, walked his opposite, a huge man, shapeless of face, with large, pale eyes, with wide, sloping shoulders. And he walked heavily, Dragging his feet a little, the way a bear drags his paws. His arms did not swing at his sides, but hung loosely. Lenny is... If you can't pick up on it, Lenny has some kind of mental disability. And perhaps the author is trying to clue you in on that a little early. Um, he certainly doesn't come out in terms that the author would use. He doesn't just come out and say... Lenny is mentally retarded. He is very careful with how he describes it. So you really gather this image of not a great guy. Um, why the author chooses to do that is likely the perception that a lot of people in the 1930s had for someone who had some kind of a mental disability. And this was perceived very negatively. But regardless, um, a little... Later, Lenny is drinking the water, and he says he's snorting into the water like a horse. The small man stepped nervously beside him. Lenny! Lenny! For God's sakes, don't drink so much! We can see already very quickly that George is Lenny's keeper. George tries his best to keep Lenny out of trouble. Sometimes the trouble is caused by George, as he says... I ain't sure it's good water. Looks kind of scummy. Then why did he let Lenny drink it? Or why did he let him continue to drink it? Um, seems like George is Lenny's keeper. Not the greatest keeper, but it works out, I suppose. Uh, as we dig a little later into the chapter, we figure out what is actually going on between the two. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, they are migrant workers. But the bus driver dropped them off, and they were supposed to walk the rest of the way to the farm. The problem was that the bus driver had a major disregard for these two laborers and kind of mimics society's feelings toward these laborers. Even in our modern times, we don't treat farmhands with a lot of respect. Respect for our government and our police officers and maybe our teachers and nurses that's pretty high but a lot of times our physical laborers and our farm hands are not treated very well so the bus driver drops them off you know just shoes them away four miles isn't a terrible long walk but he <laughs> uh george says i bet it was more than four miles damn hot day 
four miles if you were walking at a decent pace would take you about an hour to do. But imagine if you had to walk that in 90 or 95 degrees. Imagine if you didn't have the greatest shoes. That's going to kind of suck. Um, not a great time for them. So as it carries on, we hear... Lenny has this strange fascination with these bunnies. And when you read this, you may think, really? Bunnies? But you have to remember that Lenny has a mental disability and that the jobs that mentally disabled people are often able to do aren't going to be the president of the United States very often. Um, Lenny helps George to farm the land uh, they travel from job to job but as if they could live off the fat of the land as they suggest then Lenny doesn't really have to work it's more of a excuse of a job and I think George realizes this and lets Lenny dream of this idea of farming these rabbits because George could take care of Lenny. So if Lenny has something to keep his mind occupied, if you remember when you were younger, um, driving in the car before we had cell phones or iPads, you'd have to look out the window. You would have to fill your own mind with whatever you could come up with. Uh, maybe you looked out the window and you saw the guy running along the car as you were driving by all of the... Uh, since we're from Ohio, it would be areas that have lots of farmland, but Lenny is going to need something to occupy himself that's not going to get him into too much trouble, and unfortunately, working on a farm with all these people is likely to cause a lot of trouble, as we see. Uh, George says to him, now listen, and this time, you got to remember, so we don't get in no trouble. Sounds like they've been in trouble before. We get a little more detail about this, and... Perhaps there will be a bit more trouble coming. I think that's a pretty interesting point of foreshadowing. So, what does George expect Lenny to do as he comes to the farm? For a lot of people that have a mental disability, it's hard to tell. Now, you might be able to notice a few facial features, but compared to the other workers on the farm, so long as Lenny is quiet and doesn't speak up and try to you know, voice his mind and his opinion, people probably aren't going to know that he has some kind of mental disability. So, George tells him, you ain't going to say a word. You just stay in there and don't say nothing. If he finds out what a crazy bastard you are, we won't get no job. But if he sees your work before he hears you talk, we're set. You got that? Not a bad plan. Um... Older generations, maybe our grandparents or great-grandparents perhaps didn't even graduate from high school. So they could still make a life for themselves by working in somewhere like a factory or on a farm. It's honest work. It's a way to earn a living. It's a way to support your family. You don't have to have a PhD in order to do that. And that's okay. Uh, I think Steinbeck here is showing that people who are working on farms and people who are trying to just make a regular living... They can just work. And it's more than some other people can say. As we see, George is not as strong as Lenny. But he continues to try to bring Lenny in with him so that they can double their money. Not to mention that someone has to take care of Lenny. That's a very interesting conversation. What do we think that... Our government or the people taking care of these people, should they be expected to bear the brunt of taking care of a, someone with mental disabilities on their own? Should the government provide some kind of assistance? One of your writing topics were to voice your opinion about this. And for better or for worse, George is kind of stuck taking care of Lenny. Now he can have Lenny work. They get to earn double the money that way. And as we see a little later in the chapter... George takes the money and sometimes spends it on things that aren't necessarily for George, for Lenny. Um, George takes the money and goes and 
stays in a slumber house. Uh, that's what we'll call it. Uh, gets with some women and gets some alcohol. Spends the money on that. So, despite the fact that George keeps Lenny out of trouble, it's not the best con- um, relationship that they have. Okay, as we move on, uh, what do we see about Lenny wanting some ketchup? Well, <laughs> it's quite the uh, weird request. But Lenny says, Lenny watched him from over the fire. He said patiently, I like him with ketchup. Well, we ain't got any, George exploded. Whatever we ain't got, that's what you want. God almighty, if I was alone, I could live so easy. I could get a job and work in no trouble, no mess at all. When the end of the month come, I could take my 50 bucks and go into town and get whatever I want. Why, I could stay in a cat house all night. I could eat any place I want, hotel or any place, and order any damn thing I could think of. And I could do that every damn month. Get a gallon of whiskey or set in a pool room and play cards or shoot pool. Ouch. All this because Lenny said he wanted some ketchup. And as their relationship goes on... We can see that Lenny uses George, too. Um, Moving on to page 12, we see... uh, This is towards the top of the page. But I wouldn't eat none, George. I'd leave it all for you. You could cover your beans with it, and I wouldn't touch none of it. Just trying to be nicer. George still stared morosely at the fire. When I think of the swell time I could have without you, I go nuts. I never get no peace. Lenny still knelt. He looked off into the darkness across the river. George, you want I should go away and leave you alone? Oh my gosh, really? (laughs) They're having this silly. Well, I'll leave if you really don't want me. And then, uh, then George has to say, well, I don't want you to leave. And you're fine. I love you. You're great. Wonderful. <laughs> they have a nice relationship. Um, certainly, George could be much nicer to Lenny. Um, Lenny could also be less annoying to George. Lenny could not get them in trouble. They have got an interesting relationship, but George eventually warms up on the tender side. We saw in this chapter that Lenny grabs a mouse and puts it in his pocket, and it's dead. Oh, my Gosh, would it be dead? Would it be better to be dead or alive? It's hard to tell. I don't know if I would rather someone have a dead mouse in their pocket or an alive mouse in their pocket. Ugh. Yuck. <laughs> I hate to uh, think about that too much. But George has a tender side as well. On page 13, towards the top, it says, That'd be better than mice. And you could pet it harder. Now he's talking about getting a puppy. So, um,. They're trying to get along. George feels bad for effectively bullying Lenny. Lenny feels bad for asking so much and getting them in trouble. They work their ideas out. Okay. um, As we move on, Lenny gets George to talk about these bunnies again. Like, oh my gosh. If you've ever talked to a little kid, and consider the fact that Lenny's mindset is very much the mindset of a three to five year old kid. Now, Lenny can pick up huge bushels of corn and he can bale hay all he wants and he's very strong. He can do a lot of physical labor, way more than George can handle. But he's got the mindset of a three to five year old. He can't remember things. He has to be reminded several times. He loses anything that he's given, as we see a little later in the chapter. (laughs) Lenny goes, George, I lost my tickets. (laughs) And then George says, Do you really think I would have gave you your tickets? Because you're going to lose them anyway. I knew you were going to lose them. So, unfortunately, for better or for worse, George is dealing with the body of a fully grown adult, but the mind of a five-year-old child. 
I'm sure you'd get tired of doing that after a while. Especially depending on the fact that everybody on the farm, everybody they've ever worked with, sees a full-grown body. They're not going to understand that George has a mental disability. Or that Lenny has a mental disability, sorry. They're not going to understand or take that into account when they write him up on the job, fire him, or how they interact with him. One of the characters a little later uses that to their advantage. They pick up on it. But it would be kind of hard to pick up on it in a regular job. Is this guy just very uneducated, or does he have some kind of mental disability? What? If you've ever worked at a place like McDonald's or Walmart, they often hire people that have mental disabilities or slight physical disabilities. And sometimes it's hard to know. It's hard to tell. So George and Lenny, it's kind of George and Lenny versus the world. But we get this very nice speech from George on page 14. We got somebody to talk to that gives a damn about us. We don't have to sit in no bar room blowing in our jack just because we got no better place to go. If them other guys gets in jail, they can rot for all anybody gives a damn, but not us. Lenny breaks in. But not us. And why? Because, because I got you to look after me and you got me to look after you. And that's why. He laughed delightedly. Go on now, George. George is telling this pretty nice story. Um, as you read this, I'm sure you smile a little bit. Um, they just have a silly relationship. And George still takes time to re rehash their happiness and their friendship and remind Lenny that life isn't all bad. Despite the fact that George always complains that he would be better off than Lenny. He also gives him little specks and treats of happiness. So, uh, we see he's also pretty patient with Lenny. Uh, sometimes he's not, but sometimes he is. He says to him, uh, bottom of page 15, Of course you did. Well, look, Lenny. If you just happen to get in trouble like you always done before, I want you to come right here and hide in the bush. They've already got a plan for when... <laughs> When Lenny gets in trouble. Then he says a little later, But you ain't gonna get in no trouble, because if you do, I won't let you tend the rabbits. Does George use Lenny? Obviously, they're gonna be getting double the, the paycheck because of Lenny helping out. Is he really using him? Is Lenny using George to kind of be his voice? I think both characters are using each other. The message we get is that in chapter one, when he's given that beautiful speech to Lenny and Lenny gets all excited about it, the message we're getting is that, yeah, we use each other, but those other guys, they don't even have anybody to use, so sucks for them. Other ideas we get from this chapter. Let's see. For some of the discussion questions, what do we learn about the relationship between these two characters in terms of why they travel together and how is their friendship mutually beneficial? Well, George takes care of Lenny and financially by buying his stuff, making sure he's doing okay, keeping him out of trouble. Lenny gets double the money for their family. It's a nice relationship. Uh, number 8 says on page 15, what does George want Lenny to remember and how is this connected to a past incident? So what literary, literary device is Steinbeck again employing here? Um, I would say not only is he giving us a flashback, it's probably word on the street is that he may or may not be foreshadowing. Steinbeck does a lot of foreshadowing. Read into the sentences. Read the scenarios that he mentions. I think he does a lot of foreshadowing. Okay, and the last one I will leave you to ponder. This chapter contains various references to mice. What do they seem to represent? What significance might this have with regard to the title of the book, which is based on Robert Burns' poem, To a Mouse, or the story itself? 
All right, that's the end of chapter one. Hope you guys enjoyed the video, and I will see you for chapter two.